Praise the Lord. So you can tell we had a very busy week here at Destiny. We were like super busy. Thank you, John. Uh, super busy doing the work of the Lord. And so it was an amazing weekend. And, you know, first of all, um, we had our Hershey Conference, which was for uh, girls and young women from the ages of 11 to 25 years old. And we had over 300 girls show up for that. And it was amazing. If you helped and you worked and you served, we just want to say thank you. You are a blessing. I just saw one one girl that just served a whole bunch. And just worked and worked and worked. And, you know, there's so many that we could just call out that were here. And they just gave so effortlessly and just so wholeheartedly. Our staff that, that served and gave. I mean, if you could have sat in there and you could have seen these girls... These girls worked hard to get those girls there. They were out at HEB. They were out at the mall. They were out at Walmart. They were at the theaters. I mean, they were working the streets trying to get girls to come to that conference. And they were determined they were going to hit 300. And the last count that I, that I had heard was like we were at 322. And so they had reached that goal. And... And what's so amazing about that is not just that it was, you know, big numbers or anything, but it was just the type of girls that were there. They were just from every type of life. And they were just mixed in there. And, and it was different than just a regular church conference because, you know, church people know when to say amen. You know, church people need to know when to clap and, and know when to lift their hands. And, uh, but the, that crowd didn't. You know, it was just but it was so beautiful. It was so wonderful. And to see those hands, especially that first night, to see those hands go up to make Jesus the Lord and Savior of their life was worth every hurt, hurt, aching back, every sore legs. I mean, every hard work and every dime that we all gave to make that happen. It was so worth it to see the kingdom of God impacted that way. And, and then, uh, so I wanted to take a second to thank people and I didn't mean to get all mushy but it was like Whoa, you know it's and then my message is about this today as well and so it all just kind of goes together and then and then Saturday the very next morning we had our serve day which was outstanding it was so amazing I, I don't know how many people we had that came out but we had a good number that came out and we broke up and went to I don't know Kelly how many areas was it five we went to five different places in our community to do and to serve and to be the hands and feet and it was just beautiful like I had said in the video when I was there did I want to be there that morning no not because I didn't want to do what we were wanting to do but I was wore out from the night before you know tearing everything down and just getting ready for that whole uh girls conference but but you know what I pushed and I made myself and I got up and I went and you know what when I was walking just the Lions Park and uh, and I was picking up the trash and smiling at the people walking by and and saying hello and and have a great day and and talking and stuff you know what I started praying for the city as I was doing that and you know what the Spirit of God just fell on me so heavy to believe and pray and love our city more than ever you know, when you start talking to God about something other than yourself, there's something that happens on the inside of you. The Spirit of God comes in in a way that just will overwhelm you. And I felt like such a ding-dong because I was crying as I was picking up trash. People probably thought I was just crazy. It was a good thing I was kind of off to myself. Only one of our other guys were, you know, a few few yards behind me, but it was just like, you know, when you start praying for others, 
That is God's heartbeat. When you start doing for others, that is God's heartbeat. That's why he sent his son for others. And so uh, it was just an amazing, so proud of everybody that came out. And and if you didn't get an, a chance to, it's okay. We're going to have lots more. We're going to at least do four or six of those big serve days a year besides what we do in Compassion and Feed the 5,000. So, you know, it's going to be something we do regularly. And I said on Saturday morning, my goal is, I want to see this room on whatever Saturday that is get to the day where it's full just like it is right now. That we all have our destiny and our serve shirts on and we are ready to go out and to reach our city in any way we can. Amen? Amen. So all those that helped us yesterday, a big shout out to you. So let's give them a good shout out. Amen. And um, as you can tell, uh, my husband's not here. He went early to Orlando. He's preaching actually today in Daytona. And uh, then my kids flew out yesterday uh, to uh, meet him out there. And then we are, after I speak today, we're going on vacation. So praise the Lord. As you can tell, I already have vacation hair, so I'm leaving here going straight to the airport, so uh, I'm excited today, and so, but I'm more excited about speaking the word today because I just love the series. How many of you were here last Sunday and you heard the series that Pastor uh, started off on? I mean, it is called The Greatest, and I believe it is one of the greatest messages that you can receive in your heart and do damage to the kingdom of darkness with what God tells us how to be the greatest in the kingdom with. Amen. And so I'm going to pray and then we're going to get started. So God, I just thank you for this message. It's on our heart today. I thank you, Lord, that you help me uh, articulate it, Father, the way that you have given it to me. And so, Father, I just thank you now that I decrease so that you can increase. Lord, I pray that we'll leave this place changed better than the way we came in. In Jesus' name, and everybody says amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you, DJ. Well, we are going to continue today uh, talking about the greatest series that Pastor talked about and introduced to us last week. And if you did not get an opportunity uh, to be here or stream, I encourage you to go do so or go to the bookstore and invest in yourself and buy that CD because it will truly bless you and encourage you in, in what it is God has called us to do. Amen? And so today, the, what I'm going to talk about in this series on, on the greatest is that my subtitle to that is Serving God by Serving People. Isn't it amazing that God, you know, he knew before I knew that all of this that we did this week was going to be, the, you know, just take me up to the day that I actually was going to be ministering on this. Did I put it all together? No. But God knew what he was doing when he'd already, before months ago, when we'd planned the trips and the things that Pastor was doing, and then he asked me to speak and today. And, and, uh, and so God knew what he was doing because people are the heartbeat of God. God loves people. That's why he sent his son to die on the cross for us when we didn't deserve it. He sent his son anyway because he loves people. Can somebody say amen? And so by serving God, serving God by serving people is one of the key things that we have to do as a believer. And if you're one that is just always used to being served... You know, there's some of us, you know, I can, without raising hands or elbowing somebody, we can all just take an inner look at our own personal families, and I believe we can see which one in our family likes to be served more than the other. And so, with that being said, you know, it's all right, you know, for, you know, for us to uh, serve or, or we shouldn't like really want to be served, but it is okay when others serve you. And sometimes that's hard for us to receive. It's hard for us to receive someone else doing something for us. You know, because we feel, oh, no, you can't. I don't deserve that. You don't need to do that. But you know what? What they're doing is they're obeying God's greatest call, and that is to serve mankind. We are doing what Jesus did, and that is to serve humanity. And so what happens is when we serve God by serving others, it is going to make us great. 
Not that we just want to be great to have our name in lights or have a big nice gold badge to wear around and, and be hoity-toity over everybody else. But no, it is that so that we can, can build up treasures in heaven. And we'll get to that part in a minute. But in Matthew 23, verses 11 and 12, it says here that the greatest among you will be your servant. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. You know, it, this scripture, I love it, and it's important to remember it because if we want to be great or we're trying to find out who is the greatest, you know, there's a story in the Bible where the disciples were saying, well, who is the greatest among us? You know, and, and everybody throughout history is always wanting to know, well, who's better than who? than this one and who's greater who is the greatest well the answer is right here the greatest among you will be your servant for those who exalt themselves will be humbled it reminds me of the scripture about pride cometh before a fall if you're going to be all big and bad with your head up blown up so big you know and can't even get through the sanctuary doors you know what's going to happen pride cometh before a fall it says here that those that exalt themselves will be humbled. It is always God's plan for, for him to, uh, to humble those that think they're better than everybody else. And those who humble themselves just intentionally walk around not in such a, an attitude of, oh, me, and all this kind of poor me, you know, I, I don't deserve this. Not that kind of humbleness. I'm talking about the humbleness that Jesus did. Jesus knew who he was. You don't see him walking around with his head down. You saw him with a mission. You saw him on point. You saw him doing things that he didn't have to do, but he chose to do it. And when he chose to do it, he did it in authority. He didn't, didn't, wasn't made to do anything. Jesus Christ chose. God did not make his son do what he did for us. When he was birthed into this earth, Jesus had a choice. Was he going to fulfill the Father's plan, or was he going to give in to his flesh, nature. Aren't you glad he chose to fulfill the Father's plan and not give in to his flesh nature? And you know, once we have Jesus Christ on the inside of us, you know his very nature comes on the inside of us. And so that means the very power of Christ lives and breathes on the inside of us if you're a believer. What that means is now you have the ability to choose to rise up and say yes to some things and no to other things. We can't go around thinking that I've just, I have to do this or I'm made to do this or, or this is what it has to be. This is how I was raised. This is, it's always like this. My father had it, now I have it. You know, it's just going to be, no, it does not. Once you have Jesus Christ living on the inside of you, there is a choice now. Number one, you have to have, to have the choice to, to realize that, you know, old things are passed away. And behold, all things become new when you ask Christ into your heart. So that right there, if you get a revelation of that, that is the, the line in the sand. That everything that was before Christ in your life, it now is dead. If you realize that now that you're a new creature, there is nothing in your past that has to begin again in your future. It's a choice to believe his word or not. It's a choice to walk in love or not. It's a choice to get out of bed and go to work or not. It's a choice. Somebody say, it's a choice. Now, I'm a little excited, not just because I'm going on vacation in a few hours, but I'm a little excited because this message is truth. This message is life. This message will change your life about the greatest series. It will change you. You'll never live your life another day like you used to when you get a hold of the revelation that for to be great in the kingdom is to be the greatest servant of us all. And y'all got to be loud or I'm just going to preach louder and longer. So y'all got to help me. So the Bible says if you want to be great in God's kingdom, then you have to serve. Somebody say you have to serve. You have to lay down your life. You have to lay down your plans. You have to lay down your desires. And you have to pick up the desire to serve people. This is how you, how you will become great in God's eyes and receive true blessings. If you want to touch the heart of God... We need to serve people. God is always and always will be interested in people, and we serve God best by serving people. That's a good little quote there. We serve God best by serving other people. 
We serve God best by serving other people. We don't serve God best by waiting for my moment to get on a platform. We don't serve God best by waiting till you get a name badge or waiting till you get a promotion or waiting till you get this, that, or the other. You serve God best by doing whatever it is your hands can find to do, do it. I just didn't make that up. That is in the Word of God. That's Scripture, okay? A lot of times I, when I'm speaking, I'll say stuff. It's in the Word, of, but I just don't give the, the Scripture text or the reference because sometimes you, you receive it a little bit more that way. If you're, you're like, oh, okay, well, no, I just quoted Scripture. That is how it is. And that's how our everyday life should be. We should be so uh, comfortable with the Word of God in our hearts and in our mouth that it just comes out of us naturally. And it's not our things that we're saying. No, it is the Father's things that we are saying. You know, what did Jesus do? What did Jesus do? Jesus said many times, I'm not here to do my own will, but I'm here to do the will of the one who sent me. So the words that I speak, I don't speak of my own self. I only speak of those things that I hear my father say unto me. Wow, can, I believe that we can get in that same place. I believe that we can get in that same state of heart and state of mind that we can and we have the ability to only say the things that we would hear our father say. That would keep us out of a lot of trouble, would it not? Look to the person beside you and say, it'll keep you out of a lot of trouble if you just say what he says. Matthew 25 and 35 through 40, we know the scripture here, but it says, and I'll read it quickly, um, and you can turn there. If not, just write the text down. It says, for I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me what? Something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did you see, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. And if we would just remember that every day of our life, every time we encounter a situation that is making us uncomfortable with people, if we would just remember that, you know what? Great things would be unlocked in our lives. Most people can tell how a Christian really feels about God by the way he or she treats other people. That's a big thing. I can be in a situation where I'm, I am, uh, you know, dressed in disguise or, or no makeup. Because if you see me with no makeup, you wouldn't recognize me. You know, with ball cap, you know, whatever. And I can be in places that people are acting crazy. But the second they hear or recognize who's behind them in line, there's a whole new attitude that, that, that demonstrates I'll never forget being at this place uh, of uh, business here locally just last year. I was sitting waiting my turn in this uh, office, and um, a lady came in, and, and uh, she was hot and heavy, and she wanted to talk to that manager. And it's just a little area. It was like doctor's office in area. And, uh, um, and so they were, she was, you know, hot and heavy. They had overcharged her and blah, blah, blah. And, man, she was coming in raising cane. I mean, she was telling that poor little receptionist what to do, where to go pretty much, and how to get there. I mean, it was, it was getting pretty, I was getting a little uncomfortable myself and kind of scooted, scooting kind of back a little bit. I was the only one in there. I'm like, I don't know what's getting ready to happen here. Don't know, because nowadays you don't know what's going to take place with people. I don't care. You know, you don't know. So you have to be aware. So I was like aware, but trying try, try not to be aware, you know, you've done that. And so all of a sudden, so she's just getting, yeah, let me, and the little girl behind the camera, let me go, let me go, and, and, and let me make a call, or let me go try to get the manager. And so I'm sitting there, and all of a sudden, you know, I'm like over here, and this woman, oh, 
turns around, does a double take, and she goes, oh, is that you, Pastor Marla? And I didn't even want to say yes. I was like, yeah. And she just went, oh, my goodness, I just love you so much. I just love Destiny. I've been going for about six months, and I just wanted to choke. You know, vomit came up in my mouth. Six months, and you just about committed murder here at this poor soul. You know, I'm like, really? Oh, that's wonderful. I'm like, oh, my Lord. You know, and I was just like, my goodness. You know, and what was, and she was just, I mean, sweet as can be. Once she saw who I was, the lady comes back out, and that girl, I could tell she was scared to death. And she, she's, ma'am, ma'am. And she, the lady comes back over, and she's like, oh, yes, honey. <laughs> it was like, oh, my gosh. You know, it was like, what in the world? And that girl just like, uh. I didn't even tell the girl. After the lady left, I didn't say nothing to the girl. I was like, she didn't hear none of the stuff, you know. So I was like, I'm not saying nothing. But you know what? How we treat people speaks. And if you're treating people that have done you wrong, ugly, and nasty, your heart is speaking. Out of the abundance of our heart, the mouth speaks. We think that only applies to certain areas. Of, of what we're doing or, or out of a love walk with our husband or our children or, or meditating on the word. But you know what? No. It matters to who you present because out of your mouth, out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth will speak. And if it's speaking ugly about people or about situations, at, at any given time something goes wrong, what do we need to do? We need to be like, Jesus, help us. Now, I'm not the one that says I've got my tongue completely 100% in control. No one else has to raise their hand. I'm just talking about me. So, you know, if you see me getting a little agitated someday at a place, you know, then you can just say, remember that message. Praise the Lord. You know, and just walk on by, and I'll know you go here, and I'll be saying, yes, yes, praise the Lord. Okay. And I'll get my nice switch and turn it on. But it's important. Because people, you don't know who are watching us. We do not know, you know, who we're affecting. And you know what? There are children that are watching us. If you have kids in your life, they are watching us. They are watching us how we're doing life. They are watching us how we face situations. They are watching us on phone calls with people that we don't want to be on the phone with. Kids, watch us. You know, I have a little nine-year-old, and she is at that age where she watches everything. She hears everything. Now she asks, you know, sometimes when they're littler, you can talk, you know, about things, and they're, they're like, so they're not paying attention at all. But then all of a sudden, they come to that age where they understand more. And now they're like, you, I can tell because I'll hear her little iPad volume go down. And I'll know, and I'll look at, at Chad or Michaela or the kid, whoever else I'm talking to, and be like, and we, then we start talking like crazy sentences or crazy stories because we know that she, you know, is listening. She'll come running, oh, what? You know, just to see what, you know. It's like, yes, yeah, she's part of our family. That's exactly what all y'all do. Y'all dip into other people's conversations. But, um, and I don't. Of course I don't. But, um. None of them are here today. It's just me, but praise the Lord. But, you know, it's important that we, everywhere we go, it is, that should be a job every day for us. When we get up, Lord, help me be your hands and feet. Help me be the mouthpiece to bring love and compassion, even when something is being done to me wrong. You know, there is a way to walk through a sticky situation. You know, that's why I love Bible Blast's theme this year. It's about being slimed. You know, when we get slimed sometimes, we get in some nasty messes sometimes. But you know what? God can give us and has given us the ability to get us out of those sticky situations if we will just practice and do the things that God has told us to do. If we hold our peace, what's the Bible say? He will fight our battles. We don't have to get our boxing gloves out. We don't have to get all the words of our vocabulary that we used to say before we were a Christian right, uh, you know, in the back of our head, ready to just spurt out to everybody. No. 
Do good to others, amen, because this is how God and Jesus did to us. Okay, I'm going to move on to 1 John 4 and verse 20. It says, whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. Ooh, wow, okay, I like that. Y'all, you, you, help me today. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. You know, it is easy to love somebody that loves you. It's so easy to love my kids and love my family and, and everybody like that. It's so easy, but it is not as easy to love somebody that just cut you off. It is not easy to love somebody that just told you where to go. It's not so easy to, to turn the other cheek. But you know what? Right here that scripture says, whoever claims to love God but yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. They have not, how can they love God whom they cannot see when they can't even love the brother that they can see? So it's important that out of the abundance of our heart, the abundance. So if, you know what, what you feed yourself is what comes out of yourself. So if all you're doing is feeding yourself negative conversation with negative Nellie as your best friend, you know what, what's going to come out of your mouth is what negative Nellie says to you about that situation. You need to get rid of the negative Nellies in your life and get the positive Patties in your life. You need to get people that are around you that will speak life, that will encourage you, and that will feed you what you need to hear. If you, if you say, oh, all my friends are negative, then you're looking at the wrong place to find friends. Find some place, and if you can't find any, start your own group. Start your own group and call, call it whatever you want, but only allow people to join that's going to have the spirit of encouragement in that group. Only allow people to be in that group that are going to speak positive things over their futures. You know, yes, we're going to have hardship and tribulation. The Bible says that. But he also said that we are going to be able to overcome all of them. He said we're going to be able to overcome all of them. So when you realize that there's going to be stuff that you face that's going to be hard, you know, it doesn't affect you as bad and as much when you remember in your spirit and it rises up within you when the bad report comes, you hear it, you're like, whoa, but then within a few seconds you go, wow, that's not happening to me because I believe the report of the Lord, you know, whatever comes, whatever's in you will come out of you. When you get squeezed, whatever's in you is what's going to come out of you. Oh, it's great to preach and be able to speak the word in this room and say, amen, preach it, sister, whatever. In here, we're all brothers and believers, most of us in here today. But you know what? When you're out there and you're facing hardship, you know, and you're going through a situation, that's where my husband has always said throughout my entire marriage with him is when we're in ministry is that we don't want to put people in leadership if we haven't had the opportunity to see them go through the fire. Because it is not when everything's great and dandy are people showing you who they are. It is when people go through a hard situation. It is when people have to go through correction. Did y'all hear that? When people have to go through correction, when people have to go through some shifting and some change of, of mindset, how they handle those kind of things, that is who they really are. It's not when they're up on the stage singing and looking all good and, 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 and saying the right things or preaching and saying the right words. No, it is when they are facing the hardest things they've ever faced. It's what comes out of them is what has been in them. That's who they really are. We can, thank you, thank you, Pee Wee. When we miss and treat a brother in Christ, we are mistreating God. When we are slanderous, and we are slanderous to a sister in Christ, we are slandering God. When we discriminate against someone because of his race, we are discriminating against God. We should not be discriminating in any situation, whatever it is. We should not be doing that because when we are doing that, and when we, because someone is different than how we are, then what are we doing we're doing that as against God, and, and we're not to do that. I didn't make this up. This is what the Bible says, okay? Saul, who became Apostle Paul on his way to Damascus, many of us know that story, discovered that all this time that he had been persecuting Christians, he had been persecuting Christ. Now, you can find that story in Acts 9, verses 3 through 5, and I'll read it quickly. 
It says, meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. Anybody have people like that in your life? Uh, well, he went to the high priest and asked him for the letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, and that right there, he didn't care if, who you were, men or women, he was out to kill you if you were a believer in Christ, that he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice, to say, and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And Saul said, who are you, Lord? Isn't that funny? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could not see nothing. So they led him, to the hand, led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. And in Damascus there was a disciple named Ananias, and the Lord called to him in a vision. Ananias, yes, Lord. He answered, the Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. And the Lord said, Ananias answered, and I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. So, what the just is here, Ananias, he is a believer. He is a strong, devout follower of Christ. He's a prayer, and God has just now spoke to him and told him to go find the man that is killing believers. And so, as if Ananias doesn't think God knows this, he replies to him, Lord, I have heard many reports. You think God didn't know that? But... I'm sure this man was scared. He was in fear because of what he had heard that Saul was doing. But the Lord said to Ananias, go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and he entered in. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and he was baptized and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Jesus was, Jesus asked Paul why he was persecuting him. Paul had never met Jesus in person, but Paul was persecuting the Christians uh, and Jesus took it personal. I think two things here that I love about this story is that God used a praying man of God. He used somebody that was willing to open up his heart and pray regularly for the move of God in his generation to happen. That his, he was so sensitive to the words that he heard his father say that when God said something to him that was off kilter, he was able to decipher and know that it just wasn't the bad seafood he had the night before. But it was the voice of his father saying to do something that was not normal. It was not normal. It wasn't reasonable for him to go and do what he was being asked to do. But because he knew his father's voice, because he knew what his voice sounded like, he was able to say and hear, yes, and he went on his way to do that. He went, and because of the actions of this man, we are here today. We're here today. You know, we are uh, here today because of Ananias' actions, that he went and heard God's voice. All he was doing was praying. All he was doing, sometimes people think that when they're a prayer or they're an intercessor that they're not doing much. I'm here to tell you that you are doing more than you could ever imagine. You are doing more than you could ever imagine. God needs people to be able to hear his voice so that things can be released into the earth. And he was willing and obedient to go and do that and to put himself in harm's way because he could have, he, he, you know, he could have went and, and Saul could have just said, oh, great. 
and captured him and got him ready to go and be put in prison. But because of him hearing God's voice, he knew what he was supposed to do. He went and he declared it, laid hands on him, and now Saul became Paul. And Paul went around doing good works. Amen? And in Galatians, it says, 6, 7. It says, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the spirit from the spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. When I was studying this message, because this is this passage I read a lot, and I know this passage, but you know what? It never stuck out to me as much as it did just here in the past couple days, where it said, let us not become weary in doing good. We're to be about doing good. And then it says at the bottom, let us do good to all people. Let us do good to all people, and then especially those who belong to the family of believers. It says, as we have therefore opportunity, somebody say opportunity, that we are to do good unto all men. Amen? We should take advantage of each opportunity we have to do good and serve our brothers and sisters in the Lord. Amen? Uh, the Bible says in Acts 10.38, it talks about how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. You know, when God starts speaking to you, there's things in the Bible that just start sticking out to you. When, he, when you start getting into his presence and are praying and about certain things, as we've been praying about this series, about talking about how to be great and how to be the greatest in the kingdom, these things start coming out to us, scriptures and stories we've heard over our lives. But now everything starts sticking out in a different way. It says here that he went around about God, anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, and he went about doing good. I think it's funny how the order is. He didn't say that he went about healing the sick and miraculous things happened and the oppressed of the devil were set free. And then he did good. He said he went about doing good. He went about doing good before he went about healing and he went about uh, setting people free that were oppressed. I believe throughout Scripture, and if I had time to prove it, that I could probably prove to you that we are to be about doing good for others just as much as healing should be taking place. Just as much as miracles should be taking place, we should be going about doing good to others. And this message applies to every single person. Every single person. No one is exempt. No one is exempt. Some people think, oh, well, yeah, that's just for them. No, this is for all of us, everyone in the household of faith. We should be going about doing good. In Jesus' earthly ministry, he was a blessing everywhere he went. The power of God flowed through his life in ministry regardless of his location. Regardless of his location, Jesus went out and healed the sick and devils were cast out. But God manifested himself through Jesus on the coastlines, in the mountains, in the houses, and in the synagogues. So it's telling me here that it doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter what part of your day you find yourself in. When you have the ability to do good to someone else and to serve someone else, that you're supposed to do it. Because not just to be do it to be seen by men, that is you've been commissioned by God, the Holy Spirit's on the inside of you, and he has empowered you to do good. He has empowered you to go out and feed the hungry. He has empowered you to go out and serve your community. He has empowered you to come help put on a, a conference for a bunch of unchurched girls and churched girls alike. He has empowered you to come and set up the chairs in this church and take them down. He has empowered you to be back in the nursery and be changing those diapers so people that need to hear the word of God that's never heard it could hear it. He has empowered you. But people don't want to think that they're empowered to do those kinds of things. I'm here today to tell you the greatest in the kingdom is the one that will serve the most. The greatest in the kingdom are the ones that will do the jobs that gets no recognition. 
People want the titles that get them up here. People want the titles that get them promoted. But that's the way the world does it. That is not the way that God does it. And this is big on my heart right now in this season of my life. It is about serving the body of Christ. It is about serving the world. It is about what can I do in my lifetime that will make an imprint on a generation. When I am gone and I'm in heaven, I want the things that I did in my lifetime to speak and to remain. I want to be like Paul. I want to be like others in the Bible that made a lasting imprint and impart on the on the, on the body body here. It's our job to do it. And I'm fiery about it. And I'll get mad about it too. Because if people aren't doing it, I want to like, what's up with that? Chad's probably watching saying, holy cow. I can't help it. I love it. I love serving. I love it. Once you start just thinking about it and you start meditating on it, we should be trying to outserve one another. Not in a, in a competition way, but in a healthy way. Knowing as if I serve you, you serve me, we serve others. You know what that breeds and bleeds on? You know, what is that thing that, the, that in the, uh, um, the world they say, you know, pass, pass it on? They didn't create that. They did not come up with that. God, that is the principles of God. That is God. We are supposed to give to others. And as we give to others, they are to give to others. That's just how it works. Is this okay today? I'm about to let you go. One of the first things I learned at Bible college was that ministry was spelled W-O-R-K. That was how he went, and I'm thinking, I'm getting ready to spell out ministry, and they said, okay, it's spelled W-O-R-K, and I'm like, okay, okay, you know, I come to Bible school now, I thought I was, you know, going to be getting, you know, all this revelational knowledge of how to do the mighty works for the kingdom, and you know what, they taught us how to get boots on the ground and start working and serving and knowing the heart of a servant. People think that this is all the limelight. If y'all knew what I did all week long, hello. Do I have any testimonies? Is everybody that's on staff, you know, this is not, this is not the, this is just the icing. But if all you have is icing, that's sick. You'll get a sick stomach. Even though I like it. I mean, it's, you'll get a sick stomach. No, there's lots of layers that goes to being up here on this platform. But people don't want to pay the price. People don't want to pay the price that other people have had to pay to, to be having the icing. Now, I don't really care to be the icing. That's probably why I am the icing. But because I'd rather be doing the work. I'd rather be doing the hands-on stuff. Back there, you're running stuff. I'd rather be doing that kind of stuff. But you know what? The greatest in the kingdom is the one that serves. You know, I'm going to skip down. Um, you know, it says here that when we do this, treasures in heaven is what we're building up. It says uh, in Matthew 6, 19, uh, it says, Do not store up for yourself treasures on earth where moss and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourself treasures in heaven where moss and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. We said that earlier. I'm going to uh, skip on down because there's a couple people in the Bible that, that, that are great examples of servanthood. You know, the, the first being that of Jesus. You know, Jesus, when he took off his, his, his robe and he got down on his hands and knees and he washed the, the other disciples' feet. And they were like, no, 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 you can't do that. No, 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 you can't do that. He's like, if I can't wash your feet, then you can never be a part of me. He was trying to demonstrate to all of the world at that moment that, you know what, the greatest in the kingdom is the one that is serving. And it doesn't matter what accolades you hold or, or what education you hold. It doesn't matter how great you might think you are. We were all out yesterday, and it didn't matter if we were lawyers and doctors or plumbers or teachers or McDonald workers or Walmart cashiers. You know what? We were all equal in the eyes of God. We were all serving in the eyes of God. That's what he's trying to tell us, that there is nothing greater than serving. There is nothing greater than serving. Somebody say there's nothing greater than serving. I want to close with this story here. 
uh, about uh, the story of of Dorcas, you know, people want to be seen, you know, and I said that a few moments ago, people want to be seen, they want to be on the platform, they want to be seen, they want to be recognized, they want to be the head of this or the head of that, that's not the answer, the answer is serving, the greatest among you are the ones that serve the most, and that, that's a key as well, and DJ, you can go ahead, uh, the key as well is that I, I think of this, is that, you know, when we don't, when we serve not to be recognized, and we don't serve as unto man, that's the key. That is like the answer in serving for God and in your, in, in your local church. When you're serving to be seen of men, when that man is gone, when that person is gone, y'all heard that, you know, oh, when the mother hens away, all the chickens will play. That's not, that means that you're serving man. If you just totally let go and you just totally forget what you're supposed to be doing when your boss turns the corner. That's not being a servant. What's being a servant is serving as unto God. So that means no matter if anybody else sees the paper I pick up, anybody else sees the diaper I change, if anybody, and no matter if anybody else sees the time and the hardship that I have put in or we have put in, God sees it. God sees it. And when God sees it, it doesn't matter if anyone else sees it. Because He is the one that repays. He is the one that promotes. He is the one, the Bible says, that exalts. There's the story of Dorcas, and I don't have time to read it, but it's in Acts chapter 9, and it's a great story. It's short, but she was uh, the woman, that her name was Dorcas, and it was, she lived in a city called Joppa. And she was a, a lady, and it talked about her life for a little bit. And it talked about how she was one that sowed and made things for others. And uh, the one day Peter was coming into the city and, and they drew him up to the upper room where she had been. And there was a bunch of widow women up there and they were crying because she had, had passed away. And they were showing Peter all of the things that she had made them. All of the things with the work of her hands that she had done. Because that was her talent. That was her gifting. She took what she could do. And she did it with all of her might. And it said that she blessed the people and the residents of that city of Joppa. So much that the whole city was saddened when she passed. They called for Peter. Peter went. When he came, I'm going to read it, brought her into the upper chamber. And all the widows stood by him weeping and showing the coats and the garments that she'd made while she was with them. But Peter put them all forth and kneeled down and prayed. And turning him to the body said, Tabitha, which was what Dorcas, the same thing the other translation said. And she opened her eyes. And when she saw Peter, she sat up. And he gave her his hand and lifted her up. And when he called the saints and the widows and presented her alive. And it was known throughout all Joppa that many, that day that many believed in the Lord. To me, right there, we can just close the book. This woman, this little woman took what she could do, and she did it, and she did it for others freely. She did it for others and gave what she could do, and it impacted people so much that they would call for a disciple, for a man of God to come. And God be so impor impressed with that woman's life that he caused life to come back in that woman so that she would be a living testimony that we would hear about her story today. We might not have heard about her story if she wouldn't have done what she could do with what she had in our hands. It's the same thing with Cornelius. Cornelius was another story in Acts 10. It talks about, you know, he gave generously to the poor and he prayed regularly. And the angel of the Lord says in verse 4, uh, told Cornelius that his prayers and his giving had not been unnoticed by God. I'm here to tell you that God notices what you do. He notices what you do with your hands. He notices what you, he does, what you do with your finances. He notices and gives attention to that. The Bible says he takes it personal when his children suffer persecution. 
There's the story of Stephen, that when he was being stoned to death, it's the only passage of Scripture that talks about that Jesus was sitting up at the right hand of the Father, and that when Stephen was being stoned for doing the work of the ministry, that when Stephen looked up, he could see Jesus not sitting at the right hand of the Father anymore, but he saw Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father, taking it personal. What? Something has happened to his children. Jesus takes it personal. So what we do for the kingdom matters. When people see it and give us claps and when nobody sees it. And nobody may see it for years and years. People may not even see it until you go to heaven. My father, and you can stand here on this. My father was one and he was a minister. In his older years, he wanted to continue to really be active in pulpit ministry. And things just shifted in a way that didn't make that feasible for him as much. And he got so discouraged in his latter years. He got so discouraged, but he would write letters. He would write things. He would write down passages. He would write down sermons. And I would tell Dad all the time, Dad, that what you're doing is amazing. You are encouraging people. What you're doing is so impactful. But to him, he didn't think it was. He thought it because he didn't have a pulpit, because he didn't have a congregation, or he didn't have a class to be teaching that he wasn't making an impact. I want to tell you, his letters today make more an impact on on people today that his ministry of him preaching probably could ever have done. Because he did with what he had, but he didn't realize that his writing ability, his gifting ability right there was, was something that God wanted him to do. He didn't know that. So I'm here to tell you today, you might not think that what you have in your hands will help anybody. That might not bless anybody. But that is a lie from the enemy. He wants you to think that you don't have anything to give. You have got everything to give. You're gifting, you're smile, you're caring, you're able to clean, you're able to do something for the kingdom, you're able to sing or or to share or to pick up trash or change a light bulb or clean a ceiling fan. You can do something with what God has given you. Don't get weary in your well-doing. In your well-doing. What are you doing? The things that you do well. The things that you have been gifted, your skill set. Give it to God. Use it for God. Even if it's what you do for a living, you should still give part of that as a gift to people. Even if that's, you need to serve with your hands sometime. You need to, to go to an elderly you know, place and, and help somebody sometime. If you're a carpenter, you need to be giving or, or give time here to the ministry. Give time of yourself, whatever it is your gifting is. Give it to the Lord. Let him work through you. And you will, you will be amazed at what you see God do in you and through you to touch people in this world today. Can somebody say amen? Amen. Did you receive something today?